All right, we are in Hebrews chapter 12, if you'd like to open up there. Welcome to everyone who's at home watching online. We uh, welcome you and greet you this evening as well, those who are watching our live stream. Glad that you are tuned in. And we're only going to be looking at one verse here this evening. We're going to be looking at verse 2 of Hebrews chapter 12. And... We, we looked at verse 1, specifically the idea of laying aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. We looked at that last Sunday. I encourage you to listen to that message about how, as Christians, um, oftentimes we are our own worst enemies in the sense that the sins that we uh, continue to practice just uh, hinder our walk with Christ. They weigh us down. They trip us up in our race of faith. And so I encourage you uh, to check out that message from last Sunday if you were not here. But tonight we're going to focus on verse 2 and specifically the first part of verse 2 uh, where we read this. Hebrews 12, 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross despising the shame and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And so I've entitled this message, Fixing Our Eyes on Jesus, based on the first part of verse 2, looking unto Jesus, uh, also translated in other translations, the New American Standard Bible, for example, fixing our eyes on Jesus, looking unto Jesus, keeping our gaze firmly fixed on Jesus. The Lord. The Bible tells us to cast our cares upon the Lord because He cares for us. And so often our biggest problem is that we are not focused on the Lord, we are focused on ourselves. Uh, and when we focus on ourselves and we realize how weak we are and uh, how broken we are and how uh, inept we are and incapable we are so often uh, to accomplish difficult things, uh, it becomes disheartening, it becomes discouraging. But we're not supposed to be focused on ourselves, we're supposed to be focused on Jesus. Oftentimes we are focused on our problems, and sometimes our problems are, are huge, they're massive. Sometimes they're much bigger uh, than even uh, human uh, resolution. And so at those times when we're facing difficulties, when we're facing uh, uh, challenges or even impossibilities, we're to take our eyes off of our problems and off of the difficulty or off of our enemies that we're facing, and we are to look up and fix our eyes on Jesus because there's nothing that's impossible for the Lord. We're told that he is the author and he's the finisher of our faith, and we're going to look at that in some more detail next Wednesday night in the next uh, message here in Hebrews chapter 12, uh, the author and the finisher of our faith. But because he is the one who initiated our salvation, he's the one who's also going to finish our salvation. He's going to bring it to completion. As a matter of fact, we read in Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6, Paul the Apostle tells us this, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. So if you are born again, if you are a true Christian, a born again Christian, you have the Holy Spirit of God dwelling within you, then God has saved you and God has started a work in you and God promises that he's going to finish that work. He's going to see you all the way through to the end, all the way through to heaven, to be with him forever. And so we have that assurance. He is the author of our faith, the initiator of our faith, and he is the finisher or the completer or the perfecter of our faith. And so, again, so often it's because uh, we're trying to do things on our own apart from God. We're trying to take care of things in our flesh, and then we end up failing uh, even to live up to uh, the standards that we say we believe because we're trying to do this Christian life and live this Christian life uh, in our flesh instead of uh, yielding to God, looking to God, and surrendering to God and living our life in the Spirit rather than in the flesh. As a matter of fact, Paul says in Philippians 1.21, for to me... To live is Christ and to die is gain. And so uh, the idea of just uh, being all in in your walk with Christ, just completely uh, surrendered to God. And it's an everyday choice that we make. Are we going to live for ourselves? Are we going to live for the flesh? Are we going to live for the world? Uh, or are we going to live for 
Jesus, and we should just keep our eyes fixed on him, and he will see us through all of the trials and the tragedies and the difficulties that we will ever face in this life because, number one, because he's God and there's nothing difficult for him. Uh, Number two, because he loves us and uh, he went to the cross to demonstrate his love for us. And, And number three, he's conquered all of our enemies. He's conquered sin. He's conquered Satan. He's conquered hell. He's even conquered death. So he is victorious. And so we are fighting from a place of victory when we fight our battles. So looking unto Jesus again, Hebrews 12, 2, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, and he despised the shame. Turn with me to Psalm chapter 16 and verse 8. And we read this prophetic psalm written uh, a thousand years or so before the birth of Christ, but it was prophetically speaking of Jesus and actually the Holy Spirit uh, speaking through the psalmist David here. And we read this in Psalm 16 and verse 8. I have set the Lord always before me, Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Therefore, my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh also will rest in hope, for you will not leave my soul in Sheol or in hell or Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy, and at your right hand are pleasures forevermore for the joy that was set before him. He endured the cross and he despised the shame. And that's why we put our eyes on Jesus because he's already gone through the suffering. He's already uh, died for our sins and been resurrected on the third day. Uh, He's already endured to the end. And, And so if he has endured to the end, he has given us the strength to endure whatever trials or temptations or difficulties that we will face in this life as well. And so prophetically, the psalmist speaking says for you will not leave my soul in Sheol nor will you allow your holy one to see corruption and we know that this is speaking of Jesus that Jesus uh, was buried for three days in the tomb but he was raised on the third day and he conquered death and he came back uh, to life from the dead and indeed he was not left in uh, Sheol or in Hades or the place of the dead uh, and his body was not allowed to see corruption. He was glorified and he was resurrected. We go back to the New Testament in Philippians. In Philippians in chapter 2, we read this concerning Jesus and uh, his sacrifice. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 1 says this, Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, If any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Humility is what he's talking about here. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. And now he's going to give us the greatest example of humility that you could possibly ever find uh, in history, and that is the humility of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. There's no one uh, who gave up as much as Jesus did. There's no one uh, who was humbled as much as Jesus was, and there's no one as powerful uh, as Jesus. He created the universe. He spoke, and the universe leapt into existence. But notice he's telling us as his people, that we are to be like-minded with him, that we are to have love for one another. We're to be united in one accord underneath the headship and the lordship of Jesus Christ. We're his body. 
of one mind. Uh, We're not to be doing things through selfish ambition or conceit. In other words, self-promotion or thinking that I'm something or I'm somebody. uh, And and that's why I want this position or I want to be in charge of this or that. Or I want to do this or that. Uh, People have sometimes wrong motives for even wanting uh, to get up in front of people or to serve the Lord or to uh, be used of God in the church. And he's saying, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. Don't let it be a selfish motivation for serving the Lord. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. In other words, uh, putting others above yourself. Again, our problem is, is that we just love ourselves too much and we don't like when uh, people cross us and we don't like people to tell us what to do or uh, to disagree with us and and yet we are to be those who follow Christ in the example of humility, lowliness of mind, esteeming others better than himself. Look, uh, let each of you look out not for his own interests but also for the interests of others. And he says, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross." Therefore, God has also highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on the earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So our example of loving others Our example of humility always comes back to casting our eyes on Jesus, fixing our eyes on Jesus. He humbled himself. He came uh, from his throne in heaven and he stepped aside. He laid aside his power. He laid aside his position. He laid aside his privileges as the God of the universe, the God who created the universe, the second person of the Trinity. And he was willing to wrap himself in a human body, to take on humanity in order to live among us, in order to die in our place, and in order to pay the price for our sins on the cross of Calvary so that we could have fellowship and reconciliation and be restored to our relationship with God so that he can take our sins away and wash us white as snow so that we could have our names written in the Lamb's book of life and so that we don't have to go to hell for all eternity even though we deserve it. Uh, Jesus paid the price that we could never pay. And so he is our example of humility. It says being found in appearance as a man He humbled himself. He became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. He endured the cross, we read earlier, despising the shame. Uh, And he did this for you and for me. And because he was willing to humble himself and he was willing to die for others. He didn't have to die for himself. He had no sins of his own. Uh, He died for you and he died for me. He took our place on the cross and he took the punishment and the judgment that you and I deserve. In exchange for uh, the judgment that we deserve, he took that and gave us instead his glory. And he gave us eternity with him where we're going to rule and reign with him uh, forever and ever. In exchange for our sins, he's given us his righteousness. He humbled himself, being obedient to the point of death, even the horrible, torturous death of the cross Therefore God has also highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and of those on the earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He humbled himself more than anyone else, and he has been exalted also more than anyone else who's ever lived. He is fully God, and he is fully man, and he is the Savior of the world. And that one day, someday, every knee will bow. Every knee. That's including all the demons. That's including Lucifer who became Satan. That's including Hitler and all the evil, wicked people that have done evil, wicked things that are going to spend eternity in hell. There will be a day where every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is not just for you and me who are willing now to declare Jesus uh, as our King and as our Lord and confessing that Jesus, one day, 
All creation is con- going to confess this truth, that Jesus Christ is Lord, and every knee will bow. Even Satan will have to bow to King Jesus on that day when Jesus comes into his kingdom, and he takes rule over this earth that he purchased on the cross with his blood. We read in John chapter 8, John has uh, quite a bit of these uh, scenes recorded for us from the mouth of our Lord Jesus himself. A lot of uh, uh, scripture in red, in a red letter Bible, in the book of John. We read, for example, <clears throat> Jesus says this in John chapter 8, in verse 50, speaking about uh, what he came to accomplish, what he came to do for mankind. He says, I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks and judges. Remember, Jesus says, I am meek and lowly and humble of heart. Nothing that Jesus did did he do out of selfish ambition or out of self-promotion. To the contrary, everything Jesus did, every word that he said, was ordered and ordained by his Father. And he says, I don't seek my own glory. There is one who seeks and judges, speaking of the Father. He says, most assuredly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never see death. Then the Jews said to him, now we know that you have a demon. Abraham is dead and the prophets, and yet you say, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never taste death. Now Jesus is basically saying that he has the power over death and that uh, death is separation from God. And so anyone who believes on Jesus will never be separated from God. You have the Spirit of God taking up residence within you as a Christian when you're born again, and you will never be consciously separated from the presence of God once you are born again. You have the Holy Spirit, you have God in you, the hope of glory, and when you take your last breath here in this life, you will not have any conscious separation from the presence of God. You go from the presence of God of the Holy Spirit within you to the presence of God to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord where your spirit soars to be with God. And so we will never taste death. He's not talking about physical death. Physical death, we're all going to die. Everything that's living is going to die. He's not talking about physical death. He's talking about spiritual death, the death where those will be cast into the lake of fire uh, alive forever and ever. And that is the second death. And that's what Jesus is referring to. Believe in me and you will never see death. In chapter 11 of John, in verse 25, Jesus said this along the same lines. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? And she said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who has come into the world. And Jesus is telling here, he's telling Martha, her brother uh, Lazarus is dead. He's been dead four days. And and Jesus was telling her, uh, your brother will rise again. And and Martha said, I I know that he's going to rise again in the resurrection at the last day. But that's not going to help us right now. He's dead now. I believe someday he'll be raised again. But Jesus says, no, you don't understand. He says, I am the resurrection. It's not the resurrection that's going to happen at the last day. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Again, God is talking about when you're born twice, you die once. You're born once physically into this world by your parents conceiving you and born into this world, blood and water come into the world as a baby. You're born once. But if you're born again, you will only die once. You'll die physically. And that's not the most important thing. The most important thing is that you will not die a second death. You will not die spiritually. Death is separation. You will not be consciously separated from God uh, at all, ever, if you're born twice. Now, for those who are only born once, they're not born again, they will die twice. They will die physically, which is not the most important more important is that they will die spiritually and they will be separated from the presence of God, consciously separated from the love 
and the presence and the light of God cast out into outer darkness in a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth in a lake of fire along with Satan and all of the fallen angels, the demons, the third of the demons that fell are going to be there. And then all of those who have rejected Jesus Christ and all of those who have gone their own way and done their own thing and thought that somehow they're going to work their way into heaven by their good works or that they think that their uh, good works uh, are, are better than their bad works and somehow on judgment day uh, God's not going to focus on the bad things they did and only focus on and they're going to somehow work their way into heaven. And that's not going to happen. There's only one way to the Father. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. And so anyone who is believing on Jesus, even though he's going to die, he's going to live. Anyone who lives and believes on Jesus will never die. You will never experience the second death. You will die physically. You'll go back to the dust. That's because we're all under the curse of Adam, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. From dust you came to dust you shall return. That is the curse upon all flesh and all life in this earth, really. Uh, But that's not what Jesus is referring to. He is referring to eternal life, that you will never die eternally if you are trusting in him. Jesus says this in John chapter 12 and verse 23. Jesus says, The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Remember, he endured the cross and he despised the shame for the joy that was set before him. The hour has come, the Son of Man should be glorified. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. He who loves his life will lose it. He who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, let him follow me. And where I am, there my servant will also be. If anyone serves me, him, my father, will honor. So Jesus is saying that he was even going to die in the sense that he was going to be killed and he was going to be buried. But he says, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, then it grows a shoot and it grows, uh, uh, you know, and bears much fruit. And, And so Jesus is saying he's going to be put into the ground. He's going to be buried, but that's not the end. Just like the seed buried in the ground is not the end of that seed. It grows and it produces a tree and it produces much fruit but it must first be buried it must first die jesus says this in verse 27 now my soul is troubled and what shall i say father save me from this hour but for this purpose i came to this hour father glorify your name then a voice came from heaven saying i have both glorified it and will glorify it again therefore the people who stood by and heard it said that it had thundered others said an angel has spoken to him jesus answered and said This voice did not come because of me, but for your sake. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all peoples to myself. This he said, signifying by what death he would die. So Jesus did not ask the Father to save him from the hour that he was coming up to, which was his betrayal, uh, his torturous crucifixion, uh, his death, his burial. He, he, He says, what am I supposed to say? Father, save me from this hour? He says, no, but for this purpose, I came to this hour. And and he, and he says this, Father, glorify your name. It wasn't about what Jesus wanted. Jesus would say, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me in the garden of Gethsemane. Uh, Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. There was no other way for God to save mankind, for God uh, to uh, forgive the sins of man. Someone had to die, and it had to be an innocent man. It had to be a perfect man if he was going to die in the place of others, and it had to be God if he was going to die as a substitute and provide atonement for the sins of the whole world. And so Jesus says, what am I supposed to say? Father, save me from this hour as he was coming up to the cross? No, for this purpose I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name he endured the cross despising the shame for the joy that was set before him he says the judgment of this world has come now the ruler of this world will be cast out the judgment has come upon satan the ruler of this world the god of this world with a little little g 
And he says, and if I, if I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself, speaking of the cross of Calvary. And so we preach the cross, and that's how people get saved, because you preach the cross of Calvary. And Jesus says, if I am lifted up, if the cross is lifted up, he says, I will draw all peoples to myself. And indeed, 2,000 years later, and people are still getting saved with the preaching of the cross of Christ. We read in verse 42, Jesus says this, in verse 44, then Jesus cried out, or verse 44 of John chapter 12, rather. Then Jesus cried out and said, he who believes in me, believes not in me, but in him who sent me. And he who sees me, him, sees him who sent me. I have come as a light into the world, that whoever believes in me should not abide in darkness. And if anyone hears my words and does not believe, I do not judge him. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. He who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me gave me a command, what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his command is everlasting life. Therefore, whatever I speak just as the Father has told me, so I speak. Jesus came to be a light in the darkness. He's repeating what he had already said to Nicodemus there in John chapter 3. He says, I've come as a light into the world. Uh, but the problem was is that man loved darkness because their deeds were evil. So they hated the light. They rejected their light. And they chose to stay in darkness because they didn't want to bring their sins into the light. But Jesus says, I didn't come to judge the world. I came to save the world. He who rejects me does not receive and does not receive my words has that which judges him. The word which I have spoken will judge him in the last day. And so uh, it's God's word that is going to be the judge on judgment day that people are going to have to answer to the word of God. Uh, and, and we want to be those wise men and those wise women who hear the word and obey the word and we build our house upon the rock. Now Jesus says this in John chapter 14 about going to the cross. He says, let not your heart be troubled. John 14, 1. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. And so Jesus, when he was about to go to the cross, he, he was thinking that he wasn't just going to go and suffer and die on, on a cruel cross and be buried and forgotten in a tomb. We already read that the prophecy said that he would not allow his soul to remain in hell or to remain in Sheol and that he would not allow him to undergo decay, his holy one to undergo decay. But he knew that this was necessary so that he could go to heaven. He can go to his father's house and he could go and prepare a place for us, to build a mansion for us. And then he says, uh, if I go, which he did go to heaven, I'm going to come again and I'm going to receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. He says, and you know where, uh, and you know, and, and where I go, you know, verse four, and the way, you know, verse five, Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How could we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. He's the only door. He's the only Savior of the world. He's the only way to get to heaven through Jesus Christ. It's a narrow road. It's a narrow door. There's only a few that find it, Jesus said. Uh, but he calls everyone and, and he calls all mankind to come to repentance and to come to the cross of Calvary and to repent of your sins and to be saved and be forgiven and be born Again, I'm the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. And no one comes to the Father but through me. He endured the cross because of the joy that was set before him. He said in John chapter 17, in uh, the upper room with the high priestly prayer, one of the last things we have recorded before the betrayal in the Garden of Gethsemane, 
of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ's life. We read this in John 17 and verse 1 as Jesus is praying for his disciples, his apostles, and he's praying for us, for you and me. He says, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son also may glorify you, as you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given to him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. And now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself with the glory which I had with you before the world was. So Jesus has received authority over all flesh from the Father. He could give eternal life uh, to as many as the Father has given to him. And he says, and this is, this is eternal life, that they may know you, Father, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Jesus says, I've brought you glory on the earth. I've finished the work which you have given me to do. He's about to go to the cross and, and atone for the sins of the world here shortly after he said this. And he says, and now, Father, glorify me together with yourself with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Remember in Philippians 2, he humbled himself. He laid aside, he stepped down from the throne in heaven. And he, he laid aside the power uh, of being God, the creator of the universe, in order to wrap himself in humanity, to take on a human form and to become fully human, although without sin. He had no sin nature. Other than that, he was a fully a human being. He was fully God and he was fully man. And he says, Father, glorify me together with yourself with the glory which I had with you before the world was, indicating that in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And nothing came into being that has come into being except by the Word of God, by Jesus Christ. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, John chapter 1 tells us. And so Jesus uh, pre existed living in Mary's womb, the Virgin Mary's womb. Jesus has always existed. He's eternal. Uh, he is the great I am. He's the same yesterday, today, uh, and forever. He is the one who was, who is, and who is to come. He is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. So Jesus is saying, Father, I want to have the glory with you that I had with you before the world began, before we created everything in eternity past. He says in verse 11, skip ahead to verse 11 of this high priestly prayer. Jesus says, now I am no longer in the world, but these are in the world. He's speaking about his disciples. He's also speaking about you and me, those who would come after the, the uh, original disciples and apostles. He says, I'm no longer in the world, but these are still in the world. And I come to you, Holy Father, keep through your name those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are one. Remember, he who began a good work in you is going to be faithful to complete it. He is the author and the finisher of our faith. And he's asking the Father, Father, keep them through your name, those whom you have given me. And then we're told that no one can snatch us out of God's hand, Jesus said earlier. <clears throat> he says, while I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name, those whom you gave me I have kept, and none of them is lost except the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Speaking of Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed him, who Jesus said it would be better for him if he was never born. He says, but now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, <clears throat> and the world has hated them. Because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. As you have sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself that they also may be sanctified by the truth. So we have a lot here that Jesus is praying for us and we should not be surprised if the world hates us because the world hated God first and the world hated 
Jesus first. And, and the world hates us because we are not of the world, even as Jesus was not of this world uh, either. And he's saying, I, I pray that you uh, not take them out of the world, but you should keep them here and protect them from the evil one. You know, Jesus taught us to pray that. Deliver us from evil in the Lord's Prayer, the model prayer. Uh, it's literally deliver us from the evil one. And Jesus is praying that he would keep us, God would keep us protected from the wiles of the devil, from the attacks of the enemy. Now, he's not praying that we should be out of this world. He's just praying that we would be his witnesses, that we would be the light in the world, that we would be those who would be living out his word and, and doing his word and teaching his word to others. He's not, he's not praying to take us out of the world. We have a mission to accomplish. It's like Jesus had to fulfill his mission and complete his task. We all have a mission to accomplish too. And until we're done with our mission, uh, we shouldn't want to be uh, taken out of this world, although heaven, of course, uh, would be preferable to living in this life. But uh, God's got a work to do. Uh, it's appointed unto man once to die, after this the judgment, and so we are to occupy until he comes, we're to serve him, we're to seek him, and we're to be useful vessels in his hand while we are still in this world. And we're not to be surprised that the world hates us uh, because the world hated him first. He says, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their words. So here Jesus is speaking about all the believers who would come after uh, the original 11 who he had with him here. Judas had already left and had already betrayed him and was uh, about to bring the, uh, the guards with their torches and their swords and their spears to arrest him. So he's talking about the 11 who were there with him initially. Uh, the 12 minus Judas Iscariot, but he says, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. And here we are, almost 2,000 years later, Jesus prayed this prayer for us as well. We're those who have believed in Christ through their word. That they all may be one as you, Father, are in me, and I am in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me, and the glory which you gave me I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may be perfect in one and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. He says, Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which you have given me, for you loved me before the foundation of the world. Verse 25 of John 17, O righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you, and these have known that you sent me. And I have declared to them your name, and will declare it, that the love with which you loved me may be in them, and I in them." Interesting that Jesus, although he was not praying that the Father would take us out of this world, he did say, Father, I do desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which you have given me. For you have loved me before the foundation of the world. The Lamb of God who was uh, slain before the foundation of the world, the scriptures say. The plan of, of, of God from eternity was to save mankind. And, and, and Jesus uh, came in obedience to that plan and died the terrible death on the cross. But that was not the end of the story. Uh, he said that he wants us to be where he is so that we can behold his glory. Indeed, uh, he is alive. He is resurrected. He is seated at the right hand of the Father uh, forevermore. Again, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. He has sat down at the right hand of power. The right hand speaks of power and sitting on his throne at the right hand of the throne of God, the place and the seat of eternal power. That's where Jesus is now, seated at the right hand of the Father. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 1, and we get a, a glimpse or a peek of what Jesus was referring to, the glory that he's referring to, that he had with the Father before the world began, the glorified state 
the glorified body that Christ now possesses uh, after he was raised from the dead uh, on the third day and he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. We read this in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants things which must shortly take place. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, to all things that he saw. Blessed is he who reads Revelation 1-3, and those who hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. So notice here that this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. The book of Revelation is not plural. It's not the book of revelations. It's called the book of the revelation of Jesus Christ. And it's all about Jesus Christ being revealed in his glorified state. It's all about God's judgment uh, being revealed that's coming upon this earth when God is going to wipe out all of his enemies. And then Jesus Christ is going to return uh, to save the Jews. He's first going to come back for his church, his bride. Uh, then the seven-year tribulation period, the judgments of God being poured out upon a Christ-rejecting world that has chosen the Antichrist rather than Jesus Christ. Then Jesus will come back at the end of that seven-year period, and he will save Israel. He will save the Jews in fulfillment of all of the Old Testament prophecies. Uh, and then he will rule and reign forever and ever. And so it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. The whole book of Revelation is about Jesus and about his coming and about his kingdom and about his glory and his power and how we win in the end. And he says, blessed is he who reads those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written for the time is near. So for the generation of, of, of the church who read the things of the book of Revelation and hear the words of the prophecy and those things are happening that you're reading here. They're happening in, in real life. They're happening like right before your eyes. He says, blessed is that generation, those who read and hear the words of this prophecy and keep the things that are written. In other words, they're, they're obeying the word of God. They're seeing what's happening and, and, it, and it's all uh, now. It's all happening around you. He says, for the time is near for that generation. And for 2,000 years of church history, nobody understood the book of Revelation. Really, it was only until the 1800s where there was even some theologians who began to have a grasp of even what the book of Revelation was. For, for almost 1,500 years of church history, they didn't even read the book of Revelation. They didn't even study the book of Revelation. They thought nobody could understand it. It was too weird. It was too obscure. There was too many pictures and symbols and types and typology. And so they didn't even bother. There's many churches today that still don't ever crack open the book of Revelation or ever teach on prophecy. And yet Jesus said, blessed is he who reads those who hear the words of this prophecy and those who keep the things that are written in it for the time is near. And so there's going to be a generation that comes when everything in the book of Revelation is going to happen and it's going to begin to happen. And blessed is that generation because that's the generation uh, that Jesus Christ is going to come back to take to heaven uh, at the rapture of the church. He says in verse 9, skipping ahead, he says, well, let's start in verse 8. Jesus says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. This is a title for God the Father, and Jesus is attributing it to himself. I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, who is, who was, and who is to come. He says, I, John, both your brother and companion, in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ was on the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. What you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet and girded about the chest with a golden band. Now John, the beloved disciple, the one uh, who leaned on Jesus' breast when he was there at the Last Supper, 
There was the disciple whom Jesus loved, John talks about, speaking of himself, that he rested his head on Jesus' chest there at the Last Supper. Uh, John, the one who Jesus told uh, Mary, behold your son, and, and, and son, behold your mother. And from that day on, John took Mary, Jesus' mother, into his own household, and he took care of her. He basically adopted uh, Jesus' mom, Mary, when Jesus died on the cross. This same John, the same uh, John, who wrote the book of John, who wrote uh, the first, second, and third epistles of John, this same John, who was good friends with Jesus, who knew Jesus, who walked with Jesus, talked with Jesus, knew him intimately, he's about to see Jesus in his glorified state. And he can't even stand in the presence because of the glory of his friend, Jesus Christ, in his, in his glorified, resurrected state. And again, this is Jesus speaking who says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. For any who deny the deity of Christ, for example, the Jehovah's Witnesses or some of the other cults, uh, even uh, the Jew Jews who practice Judaism deny the deity of Christ, Muslims uh, deny the deity of Christ. The scriptures clearly teach the deity of Christ that Jesus is God. He says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, and that is only a title for God. But he says he saw in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, another title for Jesus, clothed with a garment down to his feet and girded about the chest with a golden band. His hair and his hair were white like wool, as white as snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace. His voice as the sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. And his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. This is Jesus in his resurrected glorified body. And he doesn't look anything like what he looked like when he walked on the earth. He's now glorified. He's radiant. He's, he's glorious. He's shining. He's illuminating. He's got like eyes of fire that just pierce right through uh, the soul. And, and he is there standing and John is there and he knows that this is Jesus, but he's not seeing Jesus like this in his glorified state so it says, when I saw him, John says, remember John was one of his best friends when Jesus was here on the earth. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as a dead man. But he laid his hand on me, his right hand on me, saying to me, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of hell and of death. Write the things which you have seen and the things which are and the things which will take place after this. And then he goes on to give him the entire revelation of the book of Revelation that John goes on to record for us. But this is, this is the glory that Jesus was referring to when he says, I pray that I would, they'd see me in the glory that I had with you before the world began. Father, glorify me with the glory that I had with you before the world began. This is Jesus Glorified. This is Jesus not limited to a human body anymore, not limited uh, to the frailties and the limitations uh, of living as a human in this world. He's now like that seed that died and went into the ground and then this great tree bearing fruit came out of the ground. It resembles nothing like the seed that died that went into the ground that was planted in that tomb when he was raised on the third day. This is what Jesus is going to look like for all eternity and he is awesome. His hair and his head are white like wool, white as snow, white speaking of purity uh, and, and holiness. His eyes like a flame of fire, fire speaking of purity, burning away the evil and burning away uh, the dross and the wood, the hay and the stubble. His feet like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace, like brass that's just glowing hot. His voice like the sound of many waters, a powerful, booming voice that you must uh, hear and you must heed. And then he, of course, has in his right hand the seven stars. Uh, out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, the word of God which comes forth out of his mouth. And his countenance was like the sun shining in his strength. I mean, it was just too much for John. John fell down like a dead man in the presence of the resurrected Christ. So Jesus, for the joy that was set before him, Jesus endured the cross and despised the shame. And he died on that cross for your sins and for mine because Jesus knew how the story was going to end. And now Jesus has the keys, the keys speak of authority over hell and over 
death. I have the keys of Hades and of death, he says. Jesus has all authority uh, was given to him when he was resurrected from the dead. All authority in heaven and on earth have been granted to me, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 28 when he gave the disciples the Great Commission. We read in uh, Revelation chapter 2 and verse 25, Jesus speaking to the church of Thyatira, Jesus says this, Hold fast what you, what you have until I come. And he who overcomes and who keeps my works until the end, to him I will give power over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. They shall be dashed to pieces like the potter's vessels, as I have also received from my Father, and I will give him the morning star. And so those who overcome... Those who hold fast until he comes, Jesus says, he's going to give power over the nations. He says, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. That is Jesus' right. That is Jesus' privilege. That's what he inherit, inherit is, uh, inherit, in, inheritance. What am I saying? That's what Jesus inherits. Jesus' inheritance is the rule of the kingdoms of the earth. That is his inheritance, not ours. But Jesus says, he who overcomes and who keeps my works till the end and holds fast till uh, t what you have till I come, he says, I'm going to give him power over the nations. And so this prophecy about Jesus who purchased uh, this earth with his blood on the cross of Calvary, purchased the title deed to planet earth to where he has all rule and all authority, he's going to share that rule and that authority with us, with his people. He shall rule them with the rod of iron. They shall be dashed to pieces like a potter's vessel. And he says that that is going to be for you and for me, for those who overcome and keep his works until the end. Jesus is going to give us, his people, power over the nations to rule with him and to reign with him for all eternity. He says in chapter 5 of Revelation, where John is now seeing this heavenly scene where the scroll uh, is being given to the lamb who was slain, and the scroll is the title deed to planet earth. And possession, uh, is take, Jesus is taking possession of that which he purchased on the cross. <clears throat> Revelation 5, 1, I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. <clears throat> then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll to loose its seals? And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth, was able to open the scroll or to look at it. John says, so I wept much, because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. But one of the elders said to me, do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures, in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Then he came, and he took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. So this scroll uh, indicated who was going to rule over planet earth. Remember Adam and Eve were given authority. They were given dominion over this earth and yet they yielded that dominion to Satan. When they disobeyed the voice of God they ate of the tree of the forbidden fruit and they listened to the voice of the serpent and disobeyed the voice of God and so they yielded uh, and, and the usurper Satan took over as the God of this world. That's why you have disease and sickness and death and bad things that happen to good people and natural disasters and all the rest. It's because Satan is the God of this world. God with a little g. He's the ruler of this world that Jesus said now the ruler of this world has been judged and will be judged because Satan was judged on the cross of Calvary when Jesus died his blood <clears throat> was the price that was required to purchase back dominion of the earth from Satan God gave it to Adam Adam yielded it to Satan. Jesus had to die on the cross and shed his blood in order to purchase back 
dominion of this earth for God and everything in it. Remember uh, the uh, one who sold all that he had? Jesus told the parable of the man for the treasure that was in the field. He sold all that he had and gave all that he, he had in order to buy the field, in order to obtain the treasure that was buried in the field. And then Jesus went on to say uh, in Matthew chapter 13, the field is the world. Jesus died and he purchased the earth with his blood not because he wanted the earth. He could create another earth. That wasn't the problem. Jesus wanted the treasure that was on this earth. The uh, pearl of great price also is mentioned there. The merchant who sells all that he has in order to purchase this pearl of great price. That's speaking of the church. It's speaking of his bride. It's speaking of his people, of you and I. And so Jesus paid the price. His blood was shed. That was the price to purchase the earth and dominion over the earth. And there was no one else worthy to take the scroll, the title deed to planet earth, except for Jesus. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. And then you see Jesus pictured as a lamb, the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. As though it had been slain, and yet it is alive because he was resurrected on the third day. Having seven horns, seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God. Seven is the number of completion in the Bible. It's the number of perfection in the Bible or totality. So seven means, and and a horn would indicate power. So Jesus is the one with seven horns. He's got absolute power, total power, complete power. I speak of knowledge and wisdom and knowing. Jesus is uh, omniscient. He's all-knowing. Uh, and so he has all knowledge, seven eyes, uh, indicating all knowledge, all knowledge, all knowing of everything, uh, which are the seven spirits of God. He had the fulfillment and, and the perfect, complete filling of the Holy Spirit upon him, and he will for all eternity. Seven, speaking of number, perfection, completion, totality. It's not like there's seven Holy Spirits. It's just seven is the number of perfection and completion and totality. And Jesus has the total filling uh, and, and complete power of the Holy Spirit upon him for all eternity. So Jesus came. He takes the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and you have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. And you have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. Notice that this happens before the tribulation takes place. This happens after the rapture has taken place. The church is now in heaven because only the church can sing this song. You have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. The church comes out of every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. And you have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. So prior to the tribulation period starting, the church is not on the earth. The church is up in heaven watching this all take place as Jesus is taking dominion and he's taking the power uh, that rightfully belongs to him over all the earth. Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures, the elders. The number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. This is literally hundreds of millions of angels and tens of millions of angels. 10,000 times 10,000 is like 100 million and thousands uh, times thousands is like 10 million. So there's these hundreds and hundreds of millions uh, of of angels and, and, and elders and living creatures that are surrounding the throne of God in this heavenly scene. Saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Notice that it's seven things that are mentioned there. Power, riches, wisdom, strength, honor, glory, and and blessing. Seven is the number of perfection and totality and completion. Verse 13, every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them I heard saying, blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb forever and ever. Then the four living creatures said, Amen, and the 24 elders fell down and worshipped Him who lives forever and ever. This is the heavenly scene. This is what Jesus was looking forward to 
when he was there, willing to go to the cross, despising the shame, enduring the cross for the joy that was set before him. As a matter of fact, this whole scene that is recorded for us in, John, in uh, the book of Revelation, we see uh, mentioned and showcased and previewed back in Daniel chapter 7. As a matter of fact, in Daniel chapter 7 and verse 9, we read this. I watched till thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days was seated. The Ancient of Days is God the Father. The Ancient of Days was seated. His garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire. Remember that Jesus, when John saw him, he looked a lot like the Father. He looked a lot like the Ancient of Days, white as snow, hair a white like pure wool. Uh, Jesus says, I and my Father are one. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. We read in verse 10, a fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousands upon thousands ministered to him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court seated and the books were opened. Exactly what we read this scene was in Revelation chapter 5. God had showed Daniel thousands about 2,500 years uh, uh, earlier. We read this. I watched them because of the sound of the pompous words which the horn was speaking. I watched till the beast was slain. The speaking of the Antichrist. Its body destroyed and given to the burning flame. And as for the rest of the beast, they had their dominion taken away. And yet their lives were pro prolonged for a season and a time then he says, I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven, he came to the Ancient of Days. So the Son of Man is Jesus Christ. This is in the Old Testament. The Son of Man, coming to God the Father, the Ancient of Days, before his throne. And they brought him near before him. Then to him, the Son of Man, was given dominion and glory and a kingdom, that all peoples and nations and languages should serve him. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. And his kingdom, the one which shall never be destroyed. So this has been written for thousands and thousands of years. This is going to happen. It's been written. It's been given under the inspiration of scripture to the prophets. And then it has been revealed again later uh, in the book of Revelation. And we are still awaiting this event to happen. But we are certainly uh, 2,000 years closer than John the Apostle was when he saw all of this uh, taking place. And he wrote the book of Revelation 2,500 years ago. Daniel saw this and Daniel wrote this down. We are that much closer to these events coming to pass where Jesus Christ comes up to his father, the Ancient of Days. He takes the scroll, which is the dominion of the title deed to planet Earth, to come and take possession of that which he purchased. And he is going to have an everlasting dominion. God's giving him, the Father's giving him a dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. Remember, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will never pass away. His kingdom, the one which shall not be destroyed. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We conclude the Lord's Prayer with when we pray uh, the disciples' prayer or the model prayer. God also showed Daniel in Daniel chapter 2 verse 44 at the end of the reign of the kings of the earth, including the Antichrist and, uh, and his kingdom, at the end of that time uh, of the Gentile pagan kingdoms ruling this earth, he says, in the days of those kings, the God of heaven, Daniel 2.44, will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to another people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. The kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is an eternal, everlasting kingdom. And he will reign forever and ever. So again, he endured the cross and despised the shame for the joy that was set before him. Where we started in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2. Jesus, when he was there in the garden of Gethsemane, uh, was pleading with his father so much so that he was sweating drops of blood. He was so intensely 
praying that if there was any other way, that the cup would pass from him. Luke twenty two thirty nine. 39. Jesus said to them, pray that you may not enter into temptation. Uh, Luke twenty two forty. 40. Then he says he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw. He knelt down and he prayed, saying, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him and being in great agony. He prayed more earnestly. Then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down on the ground. And when he rose up from prayer and he come to his disciples, he found them sleeping from sorrow. And he said to them, why do you sleep? Rise and pray lest you enter into temptation. He endured the cross, despising the shame. We read in John in chapter 19, as Jesus was beaten and he was mocked and he was brought out before the crowd, they were saying, uh, give us Barabbas. He's, you know, what shall I do with Jesus? Crucify him. Pilate took Jesus and he scourged him. We read in John 19 verse 1. The soldiers twisted a crown of thorns and they put it on his head. And they put on him a purple robe. Then they said to him, hail king of the Jews. And they struck him with their hands. And Pilate went out again and he said to them, Behold, I'm bringing him out to you that you may know that I find no fault in him. Then Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate said to them, Behold the man. And therefore when the chief priests and officers saw him, they cried out saying, Crucify him, crucify him. And Pilate said to them, You take him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. And the Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to our law he ought to die because he made himself out to be the Son of God. Therefore when Pilate heard that saying, he was even more afraid. And he went into the praetorium and he said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Then Pilate said to him, Are you not speaking to me? Do you not know that I have power to crucify you and power to release you? And Jesus answered, You could have no power at all against me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, the one who delivered me to you has the greater sin. Jesus endured all of this for the joy that was set before him. He didn't enjoy this. He endured it. He despised uh, the shame and he despised the spitting and the hatred that was put out upon him uh, from the crowd and from the people uh, and from the religious leaders and even being betrayed and abandoned by his disciples. He was, he was beaten. He was bruised. He was bloodied. Uh, his hands were pierced. His feet were pierced. His head was pierced with the crown of thorns. His back was ripped open uh, by the lashing, the 39 lashes of the whip of the cat of nine tails. Uh, he was abandoned uh, by all those who he loved. He was rejected by his people, by the nation of Israel. He was betrayed by one of his hand-picked disciples. He was hated by all in that moment. And he was taken and he was brutally murdered. And yet, Jesus was willing to go through all of that in order to procure and secure salvation for you and for me, for the joy that was set before him. He endured the cross, despising the shame. Psalm 22, the psalmist talks about what this was going to look like. And prophetically, the psalmist recorded what Jesus was going to experience. Jesus cried out from the cross, Psalm 22, 1, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Psalm 22, 6, Jesus said, I am a worm and not a man, a reproach of men and despised by the people. And all those who see me ridicule me and they shoot out the lip and they shake the head saying, he trusted in the Lord. Let him rescue him. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. He says in verse 12 of Psalm 22, Jesus speaking prophetically, many bulls have surrounded me. Strong bulls of Bashan have encircled me. They gape at me with their mouths like a raging and roaring lion. He says, I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It has melted within me. My strength is dried up like a potsherd. My tongue clings to my jaws. You have brought me to the dust of death. For dogs have surrounded me. The congregation of the wicked has enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They look and they stare at me. They divide my garments among them and for my clothing they 
cast lots. And everything that was predicted to happen in Psalm 22, David recorded a thousand years before the birth of Christ. Everything happened exactly as was predicted to happen. And Jesus was willing to suffer that penalty and punishment for your sins and for mine. In Isaiah 53, we read this. He is despised and rejected of men. Isaiah 53, 3. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs, carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes or scourging, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living for the transgressions of my people he was stricken. They made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death, because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When you make his offering, when you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his right hand. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great. He shall divide the spoil with the strong. Because he, Jesus, poured out his soul unto death, he was numbered with the transgressors or sinners, and he bore the sin of many, and he made intercession for the transgressors. Jesus did all of this for you and for me. He suffered and died that horrific, shameful death upon the cross of Calvary, enduring the cross, despising the shame for the joy that was set before him. When Jesus was raised from the dead, and this is where we're going to have to end tonight, in Matthew chapter 28, when Jesus was about to go back to his Father in heaven, we read this. Jesus came and spoke to them. This is after he was raised from the dead. Matthew 28, 18. And Jesus said, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Notice that the Great Commission is not to go and make converts to Christ, but to make disciples to Christ. Followers, those who would die daily, those who would take up their cross and follow me, Jesus says. If anyone wishes to come after me, let him take up his cross, let him deny himself, and let him follow me. So we are to make disciples of nations, baptizing them. That's the public profession of their faith is water baptism. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, the Trinity, teaching them. This is what we're doing here too, teaching the disciples, teaching God's people to observe all the things that God has commanded us in his word. And he says, lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. We have the Holy Spirit with us now, uh, and we'll always have the Holy Spirit with us until we die to go to be with the Lord. And we really don't die. We just leave this body and we soar. Our spirit leaves to go to be in a much better place, to be absent from the body, is to be present with the Lord. But Jesus, because he died on that cross, now all authority has been given to me, he says, in heaven and on earth. All authority, it all belongs to him. And that's why one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you so much for your sacrifice. We thank you, Lord, for your love for us. We thank you that you even agonized in the Garden of Gethsemane, just pleading with your Father that if there was any other way other than going to the cross to die for the sins of the world, you said, let this cup pass for me. But in the end, there was no other way. So you surrendered and yielded to the only way to save mankind. And you said, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. And you drank 
the cup of the wrath of God on the cross of Calvary for us. We thank you, Jesus, that you endured that cross and the pain and the humiliation. You endured the shame. But Lord, that was not the end of the story. You conquered death on the third day. You ascended into heaven 40 days later and you're seated at the right hand of the Father even now in your resurrected, glorified state just waiting for the orders to be given from your Father to come and take your bride, the church, to heaven for the marriage supper of the Lamb, for the bema seat of Christ where we receive rewards for the things done in this life for you, Lord, and where we will rule and reign with you forever and ever. Thank you, Jesus. You've forgiven us for all of our sins, Lord God. Thank you that when we sin, Lord, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Lord, if we confess our sins, you're faithful and you're just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Thank you that you're coming again, Lord God. You are died according to the scriptures. You are buried according to the scriptures. You are raised again according to the scriptures. And you are coming again for your church and to set up your kingdom according to the scriptures. So, Lord, help us to occupy and to be faithful, Lord, with the gifts and talents, the treasures and everything else that we have, Lord God, that it all belongs to you, that we would be good stewards, Lord, of our lives and everything we have. And bless us now, Father, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.